Welcome to the Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman, and that's pharmacy with an F, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, a place for conversations that matter. And this conversation today with Dr. Walter Longo will matter to all of you because many of you probably are thinking, how do I live a healthy, long life and not get sick? And this man has spent his life trying to answer that question. And he is an internationally recognized leader in the field of aging and related diseases. His discoveries have looked at some of the major genetic pathways that relate to aging and regulate aging and life-threatening diseases. He's identified a genetic mutation that protects men from many common diseases. And he's been cited uh, by Time Magazine as the guru of longevity. Uh, he's quite a guy. He's a professor of biogerontology and biological sciences at the director uh, and the director of the Institute of Longevity of the School of Gerontology at the University of Southern California in LA. And he also works at the um, as the director of oncology and longevity program at IFOM in Milan, and he's a scientific director of Create Cures Foundation and the Walter Longo Foundation, where he takes all the proceeds from his books and all the proceeds from the products that are designed to create healthy aging and puts it back into research. He's an extraordinary guy. His book, The Longevity Diet, is the culmination of 25 years of research on aging, nutrition, and disease across the globe. It's easy to understand, it's accessible, it's easy to implement, and is a roadmap to living well longer through improved nutrition. And I, for one, I'm all about it. In fact, I'm going to try the program now that I've read the book, and uh, you're going to hear why as we listen to Dr. Longo. So welcome. Well, thanks. Thanks. There was a long intro. Eh? I know. Uh, well, <laughs> well, you, you, you've done a lot. You got, you're, you're the guy. And uh, you happen to be the guy who everybody's talking about in terms of aging. And your program has been studied extensively across a wide spectrum of diseases. You've gotten funding from the NIH, and uh, everybody's talking about how we can use the innovations around aging that you've discovered to basically slow or even kind of reverse the process by using something that you've termed juventology, which is the science of healthy aging, and uh, something called the fasting mimicking diet. So you, you're you Italian, you grew up in Italy, and you grew up in a town uh, that had a lot of old people, but then you every summer you went to this town in a little small town in Italy where some of the longest lived people in the world are. And it just so happened that that's where you hung out and there were people who were 110 and 117. We'll talk about them. What was it like growing up there? And how did you then go from wanting to be a jazz and rock star to being a scientist looking at all this? Because it's quite a different framework. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually, I was at the uh, University of North Texas and I was studying music. It was one of the best programs in jazz performance. That's, that was my uh, major, uh, studying guitar. And then they told me that I had to direct the marching band. And I said, there's no way. I, I really it's want to be a rock, a rock musician. <laughs> and I said, there's no way I'm directing They're going to dress up in those funny costumes. No, and no. no, no, no. <laughs> or, or look at them, for that matter. Um, but, um, yeah, so I said, I'm not going to do that. And, uh, but, of course, that was an excuse. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I think I really was, my instinct told me uh, that I was interested in aging, I was interested in, in medicine, and, uh, and I just, oh, I always thought what an incredible combination of something that uh, is scientifically is a super challenge, uh, but it's, it's as high as it gets, and then medically, uh, I, I already at that time, I thought, uh, this, is, this could have effects on many different diseases, not just one. Uh, so yeah, that was the switch to biochemistry, and then and then the rest of it. I mean, and from the very beginning, all I wanted to do was study aging. Yeah, and uh, so I, I never went into it to st to be a biologist or or, or anything else. Uh, I just went into it to understand how we age and how do we keep people uh, younger and healthier longer. Yeah. So you you actually um, write about this in your book, which is that the uh, studies that we've shown longevity in animals are calorie restriction studies, meaning you eat a third less calories, you live a third longer. And there was an example of, of a group that did this in the biosphere, Roy Walford, you talk about, and they actually did reverse a lot of the biomarkers of chronic aging, but they also felt crappy and were tired and had lower immune systems and, you know, were hangry all the time. Right. So, you kind of came up with a new way of thinking about this that achieves some of the same benefits and maybe even more 
without necessarily having to starve yourself all the time. And you call it the fasting mimicking diet. So take us through how you came to discover that this is something we should be thinking about, the animal models, and then the human trials that you're doing. Yeah, so so when I was in Walford's lab um, many years ago, the idea, uh, it was almost like nobody was thinking about the origin of things, right? So it's a 30%, you eat 30% less and that's it. And I always thought, this has got to come from something much more deep and, and meaningful than just eating 30% less. So I was observing, I went back to the biochemistry department from the pathology department where Walford was, and I started to study starvation in bacteria and yeast. And I saw that you could starve completely a bacteria or a yeast, and they live a lot longer. And this is permanent. So it's not like you starve them for a little bit. You, you starve them, and you keep them under starvation, and they live very long. And so I started thinking, it must be the other way around. It must be the color restriction foundation is in starvation. And so it all comes from starvation. There is no magic color restriction effect. Uh, but the starvation for a human being or even for a mouse must be periodic. Once in a while, you starve, and then you f in the rest of the year, you find enough food to, to eat. And, and that's what I started thinking. And that's historically what humans did, right? You that's know, historically what scarcity. You, you know, you can't go to the grocery store. You got to go hunt and gather and find whatever you can. Exactly. And sometimes, of course, that period could be months long and uh, not much longer than that because then you die. But, but let's say potentially it was very long. You go through periods of, of not eating for, for one or two months. Uh, so, yeah, that was the idea. So what, what if you just take somebody, at first we study fasting. What if you take water-only fasting, and then uh, expose people, mice or whatever, to, to it, and then back to the normal diet. Could that reprogram the system into having long-lasting effects? And so that's, that's uh, we started with water-only fasting, particularly for cancer, and then we moved for to- For animals, uh, water-only fasting. At the, at the beginning, it was just, yeah, water-only fasting. We took mice, we switched it to, to water, and we were, we were very interested in uh, um, chemotherapy protection, differential chemotherapy protection. So the idea was, can you protect a normal cell with starvation, with fasting, but m not a cancer cell? And it turns out to be a really powerful way to kill cancer cells and protect normal cells. And now we're, you know, we have an, a number of clinical trials finished and, and many more ongoing, but it seems to be working uh, very well. So that was the original idea. And then we moved to fasting mimicking diets, uh, in part because nobody wanted to fast. And, and oncologists- You eat nothing. Yeah, no, the oncologists were very much resistant to that. And patients, surprisingly, were more resistant to it than the oncologist. Uh, not having uh, any, any, food. any food. And there was part of the psychological aspect. Uh, the, the patient, lots of patients felt cheated. They felt like, uh, how is it possible that my doctor tells me that the, the treatment here is to do nothing? And, uh, but also it was very tough. Uh, psychologically, it's a moment when you're, when you're sick that um, it's very difficult to, to be without this sort of comfort. Food, yeah. yeah. Right. And, and this is not just cancer patients. And we learned that um, most people are like that. And this is where the, the fasting mimicking diet idea comes from, uh, you know, to, to worry about also the safety of the fasting uh, and uh, the compliance uh, and, you know. Uh, of long-term fasting. Of long-term fasting, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so what what this seems to do is activate the body's healing system, which is pretty interesting. So. Most physicians were trained to treat diseases with drugs that suppress symptoms or target a specific pathway or mechanism. But your work has shown that you're really not doing that. You're focusing on the inherent repair systems, the regeneration and healing mechanisms in the body, the programs, as you call them, that can get activated by specific interventions, which then can be applied across all sorts of diseases. So it seems almost incredulous that you could say that eating this way, which is short periods of restricted calories for five days could help treat Alzheimer's and cancer and diabetes and colitis and MS and all kinds of other stuff. How does that make sense given our current paradigm? Yeah. So think about cancer, right? So we, we've been fighting the war on cancer was Nixon. Nixon came up with the war on cancer. Yeah. And, um, and it, 50 years later, we now have 
the most effective and most, uh, uh, in, uh, most promising intervention in cancer is immunotherapy. And what is immunotherapy? Immunotherapy now, uh, for which the Nobel Prize was given in 2018, uh, in Nobel Prize in Medicine, uh, is uh, basically making the immune system attack the cells that don't belong, yeah. right? So uh, allowing the immune system to attack the cancer cells that have now figured out by a couple of different uh, mechanisms how to tell the immune system cells, stop, don't attack me, right? So the, the immunotherapy is removing two uh, molecules or inhibiting two molecules, PD-1, PD-L1, and CTL4, right? And allowing the immune cell to do its job. And uh, so, that's a great example of, yeah. and, you know, and, and some of the people that I've been talking to, they were saying 10, 15 years ago, uh, they were uh, attacking these immunotherapy uh, scientists and saying, come on, this is an old idea. Yeah. It's never going to work. Yeah. You know, we have all these sophisticated targeted right. technologies. <laughs> right, right. And they kept saying, no, let the immune system find its way. Let it find the wrong cell because now you have a real cure. It's going to go everywhere in the body. It's going to attack. You just have to figure out how. Well, with fasting, fasting is probably the most powerful natural intervention to, we believe, we're starting to believe, because it's working with so many different uh, things, we're starting to believe that it was the moment, uh, kind of like sleep. If you think of sleep, it's the moment where you rest, right? But not just rest at the, the general level, but probably having all kinds of systems like DNA repair, et cetera, et cetera, do their job. And, and so it, it, it is a moment of rejuvenation, if you will, right? So we believe that maybe fasting was the moment where the body went to the body shop and the, uh, and the mechanic and everything got fixed. Right, and so something was not working correctly. You remove it, replace it. Right? So, um, so that's what we think it, it it could explain all these very different effects. For example, how can it go on one side after the inflammation, reduce inflammation, but at the same time promote the inflammation dependent attack of cancer cells? Yes. It's just the, the opposite, two opposite things, and then you know kill the cancer cell and then regenerate the pancreas when, when it's damaged and uh, promote the regeneration of the liver, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, so I think that maybe that's what it was always there for, uh, identify things that are dysfunctional, old, and replace it's them. It's a way with of cleaning up house. Cleaning up in, in, a, in a very sophisticated manner. And we already know that the body can do that. I always say if you cut yourself yeah. um, after a couple of weeks, it's gone. Perfect repair. And yet the skin keeps getting old. And so <laughs> right, how is yeah. it possible that it just can, it, so sophisticated, yeah, a, a right. perfect repair, and it never does that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so fasting potentially is, um, is one of the most powerful. We, I mean, we, I really see no evidence of anything beating it that I've ever, no. or even getting close to it. Well, it's just radical. What you're saying is, you know, we've had century of medical innovation and drug development and technology innovating care and what you're talking about is that food is more powerful than all of those things in fact you coined this term nutra check nutra technology which is about treating the molecules in food as drugs yeah but now let let, let me um go back to cancer right so we almost never see cancer-free survival when we only use fasting mimicking diets. We always see it with the drugs, right? That's and, a combo and so treatment. to me, it was always like, for example, if you're talking about diabetes and lots of other things, the drugs don't seem to be necessary. But when you get to cancer, uh, we have not been, we cured lots of mice with combination of chemotherapy mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, uh, fasting mimicking diet. We've never been able to, to do it uh, with just, uh, for sure, with the, with the chemo alone, and, but also with the fasting mimicking diet alone. So the chemo and the fasting mimicking diet work about as well. Uh, yeah. But you combine them and they're very powerful. So we yeah, really you, you were presenting at a conference this morning and we had a fantastic slide up there showing that the effect of fasting, the effect of chemo, and the combined effect was multiples. Yeah, multiples it's synergistic of. for sure. And so the point is that we're not about 
for drugs against drugs we're about patients how do you get somebody to get 110 to 110 healthy and if you Why have cancer 110? what about 120 yeah maybe 120 <laughs> uh, but but if you if you prevent cancer absolutely no drugs are needed to prevent cancer and to to just act on the aging program and on the longevity program but if you have cancer we really think that whether it's immunotherapy kinase inhibitor chemotherapy radiotherapy surgery they're really going to be uh, very, very important together, together yeah. with the fasting making diet. And we'll see, you know, the ketogenic now is also emerging uh, as a potential co-treatment. Uh, you know, Lucantil has done really great work uh, combining ketogenic diet with, with uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors, for example, lots of potential there. And uh, so I think that uh, it's not just about the fasting making diet, but certainly the EFMD seem to be, uh, because you just do it for uh, four days, five days, with the treatment and then you let the patient uh return to their normal diet we think that that's uh, that's got so, high so potential let me just back up a little help people understand what the fasting mimicking diet is before we go into more detail about it because it's fascinating essentially it's very short periods of calorie restriction 800 to 1100 calories five days done a few times a year two or three times more if you're treating something serious like an autoimmune disease or maybe cancer but it's not that much time out of the space of a year to do this. And this product, this program, uh, has the ability to treat so many different things. And one of the things you said this morning that was really powerful was that it takes many drugs to do what a fasting mimicking diet does. Yeah, I mean, right? they, and this is a and this the is drugs a fact. don't even do the same yeah, effect. And right? this is a fact. If you just look at cancer, uh, and in fact, I had somebody who came to me recently and said, you know, well, when we use these cancer drugs, we got a problem because we can lower insulin and we can lower glucose. We, we, we have nothing yet that can lower insulin and glucose at the same time. And he was saying that your diet is about it, right? So this is just two of the things it does. It also lowers IGF-1, it lowers leptin, it revolutionizes the, the, uh, the growth factor uh, uh, and inflammatory, et cetera, et cetera, environment. Yeah, so it would take many, many drugs to get the effects of fasting, and nobody argues with this. This is not an opinion anymore. Right. Uh, now, you could argue Although, with, that all those changes may or may not affect cancer. You know, we have to still see, but we have lots of clinical trials now, and certainly mouse data indicating that, that it does and does very in a very powerful way. So, so there's there's a bunch of things you threw in there, like ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting. There's this whole field out there that's moving in the direction of some type of fasting mimicking approach, right? Not your fasting mimicking diet, but ketogenic diet is sort of a way mimics fasting and may activate a lot of the same mechanisms. Y yes and no, right? So let's, yeah, it's a good opportunity to talk about that. Yeah. I, I think people are confused and ketogenic is the latest hot thing. What you're saying, is that necessarily necessary? Yeah, the ketogenic diet, first of all, it can be high protein, it can be low protein, right? So, so that's already a big, big distinction, why? Because we can see that if you add back proteins to the fasting mimicking diet, you cut out, cut out about half of the effect, right? Really? And if you add sugar, you cut out about the other half. So if you <laughs> add sugar and proteins, you now eliminated the effect pretty much of the fasting mimicking diet. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, but the ketogenic fat. diet, okay. if it was a high fat, and uh, in the, that's what the fast making diet is, right? The f high fat. But we also have relatively, and this is the prolonged uh, fast making diet, we also have relatively high carbohydrate, you know, all from vegetables, right? Uh, and no legumes, all from vegetables, because we want to keep the proteins low, right? So it's, uh, it's vegetables, nuts, and those are the, 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 the major ingredients in there. And the reason for that, is that we're, we're thinking not what happens after you do three cycles of this. We're thinking, what if you were to do 300 cycles of this, right? And I don't want, even though I could get more benefits from a lower, more ketogenic diet, a lower carbohydrate diet, I don't want to do that. Why do I don't want to do that? Because I don't want people to go back and forth in this yo-yo manner to very low carb, very high carb, very low carb, because I'm worried that in the long run, that's going to stimulate too many uh, uh, variation in the programs, and some of them are going to have detrimental effects. So we're not used to this back and forth. And so I don't want to introduce it. I already have a, a very potent effect 
but not as potent as I could because we always get asked, oh, why don't you reduce the carbohydrate in the FMD? And, and that's on purpose. We want to keep it so we don't push you to the edges. But it's not starch, right? It's vegetables. It's not starch. It's, it's all vegetables. And vegetables there are, and there are, nuts which have yeah, carbohydrates. But it turns out to be 45% carbohydrate of that kind, right? So yeah. in, in the well, low-calorie That's low an important distinction because when you say carbohydrates, people think of pasta and bread and bagels and sugar. But you're talking about plant-rich carbohydrates that are low in glycemic index. Oh, yeah. These are, are low or very low. I mean, you have some, some so you have tomatoes, uh, you have uh, um, you know, broccoli, you have all kinds of vegetables, and, uh, but they do contain lots of carbohydrates. You know? And, and uh, uh, so at the end, it's about 45% carbohydrates, 45% fat, and about 10% uh, protein. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, you take... 21 cups of broccoli that's the same amount of calories as one big gulp soda right they both have seven yeah, the calories yeah. they are both carbohydrates they're both really different absolutely yeah so we're not trying to say that the um um it's about having carbohydrate we're trying to say that it's about to have very specific carbohydrate and in a paper that we are about to publish that um looks at if uh, water only fasting and the fasting mimicking diet. And we're showing that the uh, prebiotic ingredients in the fasting mimicking diet, which are vegetable based, all vegetable based, uh, are feeding the good bacteria, uh, lactobacillus, bifidobacteria, et cetera, et cetera. And now you have this big increase in this protective anti inflammatory bacteria, which you don't get with the water only fasting, right? So now the content of the, of the diet together with the fasting. So it's the combination of the fasting and the content of the diet driving the repopulation of the gut of the mouse to the point that it reverses IBD, right? So it reverses colitis, it reverses Crohn's. It's a mouse model. So, you know. What are the, what are the fibers and pre prebiotic that are in there? Is it just vegetables? Yeah, uh, we don't know which ones are responsible for this growth, but there is uh, a, a number of the vegetables that, have, that are known to promote lactobacillus bifidobacteria, et cetera, growth, right? So we suspect that the high content, and it's just, uh, we actually have a high content on one of the days, and then we lower it. So it's, it seems to be about content, it seems to be about timing, uh, and, and it seems to be also about refeeding, right? So you have the, the big switch doesn't really occur while you're in the FMD mode, it, it occurs after the mice return to the normal diet, right? So it's a really, complex um, uh, remodulation or modulation of the bacterial or, or microbe uh, uh, population in the gut that seems to be then communicating with the immune system and communicating with multiple systems. And, you know, it's not the whole effect because we see much more than that. But certainly when we do fecal transfer, so we just take the, uh, the FMD, the the, the um, bacteria from the fasting making, fasted mice, fasting making yeah. diet exposed mice, and we transfer it into recipient mice, they have some of the effects. They show some of the effects, but not all of the effects, right? So, so it means that that, micro, uh, that uh, microbe uh, population is important, but it's not the whole uh, yeah. deal, as we expect, by, because we also see, for example, um, gut regeneration, uh, and we see a general anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, so the, the, uh, even systemically, the inflammation comes down, right? So it's, it's affecting microbiota, it's affecting inflammation, it's affecting regeneration. And again, you have to think it's going back to the body detects something wrong and it does all that is needed to So essentially to you're it. challenging the body with a stress, which is a low calorie diet, but it's highly nutrient dense for a short period of time. And the body is like, oh, danger, danger. I got to put in and get all the repair mechanisms going so that I can fix this problem. Yeah. But, you know, a really interesting thing that was just pointed out uh, by my student the other day. If, if you take water only fasting and you give it this toxin. And so this is very nice because it's, it's very uh, recapitulating of the expo how we may get Crohn's disease and colitis. You know, a lot of toxins from the outside, right? And so you give it this toxin and you're doing water only uh, fasting, guess what happens? They have more leakage. Right. They have more blood in the stools, right? So the, the water only fasting is making the gut leaky 
and worse, right? If you do the, the FMD instead, it seems to maybe because it's telling the gut, I'm not fully fasting, there's still food coming through, don't break down. So because one of the things that are really, very well established with the fasting is the breakdown of the uh, lining of the gut, right? Because you don't need it. It's not as important in that moment because you're not feeding, right? So it is a, is a good uh, probably way to save energy. And uh, so potentially, this is how tricky it gets. And we, we never, I would never in a million years have expected that water only fasting would make the gut more leaky, but only in combination with this toxin, right? So probably if the toxin is not there, you're okay. Right? When the toxin is there, now the, the, uh, um, the blood is starting to get in, in, the, in the stool. Uh, so yeah, so then, I think this is the food that is giving the signal. Don't break down completely yet. Do it partially, and we see high levels of regeneration. The stem cells, the, the, the intestinal stem cells, are getting activated, you know, um, very potently. And then during the refeeding, they give rise to rebuilding. The inflammation is moved out, and the uh, colon. You actually shorten the colon, and then you start the FMD cycles, and it, it goes back to its regular size. Right? It's really a remarkable. It's pretty here. amazing. So we know a lot about aging uh, in terms of what are the mechanisms that are driving it. It's inflammation. Sometimes they call it inflammaging, uh, oxidative stress, and activation of various pathways like mTOR, which is uh, basically a pathway that's activated by protein and various other things that can when it's overactivated can cause aging mitochondrial injury uh we have to activate stem cells in order to heal and it seems like this one approach of a nutrient dense short-term calorie restricted diet seems to take care of all these things is that true well i mean i don't know about all, all of these things but it seems uh, the majority and, and i think for example with inflammation and aging i think people get it wrong right people think that inflammation causes aging but it's the other way around. It's aging that causes inflammation. Very clear, you know. And inflammation, in fact, one of the criticisms in the paper but was... then what's causing the inflammation? The dysfunction. The, the, you're starting to have accumulated junk in the cells. Uh, you're starting to have DNA mutations. You have, you know, damaged mitochondria. You have just general damage. As you move forward, any system is going to accumulate uh, protein aggregation, right, in, in the brain, phosphorylated tau, beta amyloid, olig uh, oligomeric amyloid, right? So every system has got its junk that it gets accumulated. And of course, what happens in the brain if you start accumulating beta amyloid? The microglia start attacking. That's the, the immune glial system of the brain, right? Yeah, the microglia, the immune system of the brain, or part of the immune system of the brain, is starting to recognize them as foreign. They start attacking. You begin the process of inflammation, right? So, so yeah. It, so most it's an inability like, to get rid of junk and waste. And, yeah, and, and in fact, you know, one of the things that happened in this paper that we just published, um, interleukin, I think it was uh, TNF-alpha and several other pro-inflammatory markers were way high in the fasting mimicking diet. Really? And, we, and, and all the reviewers were saying, oh, this is bad. And we said, no, go read the papers. If you look at these two markers, they're central in what's called inflammatory regeneration. So the inflammation may actually have always been good for you if coordinated, what is the body who's trying to do with the inflammation is fix the problem. Yeah. So, but it cannot do that because the system is so damaged and there is not the conditions to repair it. So it keeps spinning the wheels. Yeah. So these TNF alpha and other inflammatory marker interleukins are trying to fix it. And, it's, and this is not, I'm not saying it, it's a very well established that these are central in the repair process. So then after you finish the fasting making diet, you'd assume that the markers would come down as the body repairs. Yeah. Is that what you see? Yeah. Well, we haven't looked long enough, but of course, they're mm -hmm. going to come back down. So once you repair it, once the, the autoimmune uh, problem has gone away, uh, now they're going to come back down. And in fact, we looked this also in, in the paper, we have human inflammation, uh, body inflammation. So what you see is that uh, in people that have high C-reactive protein, that's systemic, a marker of inflammation. Marker, systemic marker of inflammation. Uh, we looked in this new paper, and we see that white blood cell count goes up, right? So then you start doing the FMD, and the CRP comes down, and the white blood cell count comes back to, to normal, right? And it does during the F FMD, but more also after. When you look uh, a week later, 
now the white blood cell, bl the white blood cell count is restored to the normal levels. So you you sort of treating all these different conditions we talked about, whether it's autoimmune, whether it's gut issues, whether it's the aging process itself, whether it's Alzheimer's, but also it seems that just these short periods of fasting leads to reversal of metabolic diseases like weight and obesity and diabetes. How does that work? Because if you're only stopping the calorie influx for five days, how does that carry over to sustain change? I don't understand that. I think many people are wondering how, in fact, does just restricting your calories for five days a few times a year have all these long-term lasting benefits? It seems like yeah. too good to be true. Well, yes and no. Um, for sure is going after the visceral fat, right? So we know that the visceral fat- Belly fat. <laughs> yeah, we, we, show, uh, we, uh, we know from many other papers that this, this belly fat is so central in insulin resistance and all kinds of other problems. And so, of course, after uh, two or three days of, of, of a fasting mimicking diet, we have shown in the paper that everything turns into belly fat consumption. So the body is going after, I mean, that's it, the, the reservoir. That's a food reservoir. So you don't need the ab roller, you just need the prolon diet. You don't, <laughs> you don't uh, interestingly, it didn't take it from subcutaneous fat. Yeah. It only took it from visceral. And we showed this in mice with, uh, with the scans and, and in people with the DEXAs. Uh, so uh, that's for sure uh, one way, one of the major ways. Wait, they, I gotta pause there because that, what you said was pretty profound. When you do this approach of short-term calorie restriction, you target the fat that causes all the chronic diseases, which is the belly fat or abdominal fat or visceral fat, and not the regular fat around under your skin or the subcutaneous fat. That is a profound, important discovery yeah. because that is the fat that we all need to target. Yeah, the other interesting thing is the lean body mass differential effects, right? So it's targeting the fat, and it temporarily you see the lean body mass, as measured by DEXA, go down. And then- So you when lose muscle. You lose muscle, but only temporarily, right? So usually in all kinds of diets, you lose the fat and the muscle. Here, you lose the fat, you lose a little bit of muscle. When you refeed within a week, all the muscle is back, right? So now you have an increased relative lean body mass. So you now gain muscle mass. You, you pretty you much go back, back to the, the absolute normal level of, of muscle. But now compared to your body weight, you've gained muscle mass. So you have more- Without exercising. Without exercise. No, no in, in intervention. So that's one way. The other way we think that makes a big difference is almost everybody will say the following. <clears throat> when after I got through one, two, three cycles of the FMD, I started looking at food differently. So, <coughs> <Hold on second. coughs> yeah, you want some water? Yeah. So, mm. yeah. after I, I went through one, two, three cycles of the FMD, I started looking at uh, food <coughs> differently. And so, for example, if somebody had lots of sweets uh, and lots of candy, lots of starches, et cetera, et cetera, they um, don't feel like eating like that as much. So they, they, they all say- So their cravings uh, go away, their tastes change. Yeah, I think maybe because of the microbiota, maybe because the brain now gets, um, sees the association. Lots of people might have never done five days of a vegan diet so, so often, right? Completely, 100% vegan. So it is possible that, uh, that the brain now recognizes the wellness that is associated with it. And, and then out, without anybody telling them anything, they begin to say, I felt better yeah. when I did that. I'm not sure. So for example, I had some obese people that said, I used to eat pizza all the time and I could finish you know, two, two entire pizzas. And now they say, um, I may have a few slices and I just don't feel like continuing to eat. So it's, it's really, I think, a conversion of the behavior uh, based on instinct and not based on, um, on, on uh, you know, rationale or, or, or thinking about it. So we were talking a little bit before about the ketogenic diet combined with fast mimicking diets for cancer and other things. Talk more about that because I think people are confused about the variations between fasting mimicking diets and ketogenic diets and intermittent fasting and, and when you should do what or if you should do any. Like what What is the, the expert's opinion here? Because yeah. you're probably one who knows most about this. Yeah, so f first of all, I always say I hate in the word intermittent fasting because it doesn't mean anything. I mean, intermittent fasting goes from I haven't eaten for two hours 
to I haven't eaten for two months. Right. And so uh, it goes from I haven't eaten anything at all or I had uh, lots of food in a fasting mimicking meal. Yeah. So yeah, it doesn't mean anything. So we need to move to ex what exactly did you do? Or what exactly should you do? And, and I think my people book, are referring to like time restricted eating, where you eat within an eight hour period. Yeah. So if you if you look at uh, time restricted eating and the work by Sachin Panda, but if you look at all the data, you would uh, say that uh, say 12, 13 hours of fasting per day are very good That's and normal. very safe. Yeah. Well, it's normal, but nobody does it anymore. If you look at Sachin's uh, data, it'll show uh, the average is about fifteen hours. And I think this average of 15 hours, it comes with this idea that you should eat five or six times a day. So now, you know, to, to eat five times a day, you're stretching the amount of hours. And so when he did this study, and they just asked people, you just mark down when you eat. It was 15 hours. It was not 12. Uh, so now I think if you went, in fact, when they went back to 12, people start doing a lot better. Now, the argument is, well, what if you go down to six uh, could you do even better or, or eight, let's say, uh, hours where you eat and the rest of it you fast? Well, you, then you start seeing, A, not too many people in history did that, and B, you start seeing the problems, you know, and the problems include uh, gallstone formation, uh, and the problem include uh, many, including our own trial, that we, uh, our own study, epidemiological study, people that skip breakfast, they usually do worse. And, uh, and, understandably you can argue that there is already reasons for for that but that's not a good start right so i would say if you keep it 12 13 hours seems to me like it's a good way to go and it's very safe there is really no negative association with even the 13 hours that i've seen maybe a little bit slightly slight increase in goldstone formation but it's very slight when you get to 16 to 18 hours then you start seeing twice as much risk of, of you know go bladder removal not the nicest thing that could happen to you no. <laughs> uh so so that's that's uh, that's the thing so yeah and so there's all kinds of fasting and then what about uh, ketogenic so yeah so ketogenic diet again what does it mean you know uh does it mean that you're going to do it for a month does it mean that it's going to be low protein high protein animal based and so I again we're right. ketogenic we gotta go move away in my opinion to the world and move into what do you mean yeah. right just like medicine any drug that you take you know, say oh my it's a drug that generally blocks the cholesterol pathway no it doesn't work like that it's like well exactly what does it do and show me the data on thousands of patients etc cetera, etc cetera. so here i think we need to say in my opinion a a little bit higher fat uh you know uh, ketogenic uh, not ketogenic but certainly uh, I think the 60, 30, 10 is an ideal diet if you, for all time. So 60% carbs, mostly from vegetables and legumes, 30% uh, fats, f mostly from olive oil, nuts, and uh, a, a fatty fish. Yeah. And 10% uh, and protein, mostly from legumes and fatty fish. Uh, that, that seems to be ideal, not based on my opinion, but really going around the world, looking at the basic research, looking at the uh, uh, clinical trials, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, for you specific uses, I think that the ketogenic diet can be modified, be more extreme, right? So if you, you have somebody that has you know, overweight, obese, all kinds of other problems, yeah, that's where I see that, you know, let's say a, a much higher... Uh, fat level, a much lower carbohydrate level, being very useful to get the person to where they need and that's to be. That's over two billion people on the planet. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's a right. lot so, of people are so, in the can, this country. It's fifty to seventy percent. Yeah. Th so the question is: um, Is that reasonable and is it safe for? Uh, and how should you do it? Let's say, let's say an 80, 10, 10, Right. That that could be. A possibility. So, 80% uh, fats, 10% um, uh, proteins, 10% carbs. But how long can somebody stay on that? Uh, and what would? And uh, you know, how long can they stay on it? And, and how long do you want to keep them on that? Yeah. Uh, without risking them getting into the epidemiological data, clearly showing that low carb diets, um, if they're animal based. Uh, they could be detrimental. And I know we disagree uh, uh -huh. on this, uh, but, well, you know, but I mean, you know, that uh, I'm just thinking, 
I, I, I think it'd be good to come up with things that we know. And that's what I try to do with the book. Come up with things that we know there is no way it is bad for you. Yeah. I mean, that like, is, that is I great, came up with yeah. this denominator where like, there is no way, I don't care what they, they need to, like, 200 years of publications to, uh, to say that this is, why? Because the centenarian is one of the pillars. These guys have been doing this for, you know, over 100 years mm -hmm. and uh, in different parts of the world. And, and, and they eat real food, they don't eat a lot they of eat sugar real food. and starch, yeah, so, they yeah, eat and that's, good fat. And that's a recommendation, they, right? So if you do that, you're, uh, you're, then you're for sure in good shape. Now, the argument could be, who's going to be able to do that? Okay, then we say, well, what's the second best that people can, can reasonably do? I think it's reasonable to eat a 60% uh, you know, uh, vegetable and fish and uh, legume diet. Uh, I think it's reasonable to have 30% fats. Um, you know, and if somebody cannot do it only from vegetable sources, you know, whatever you can, add some animal sources, that's okay, and 10% protein. 10% protein is, you know, to most people is, um, you know, 50, 60, 70 grams of protein a day. Uh, so it's not that low, uh, and I think... Uh, but even yeah. in your own work, in your paper in Cell Metabolism, you sort of talked about how there's a, a benefit when you're younger, but as you get older, you need more protein for building muscle. And you need, you know, significant amounts of, like for example, you know, more protein that you talked about would be two cups of yogurt or five ounces of nuts or, you know. Yeah, so more more protein and, and more variety. I think uh, we were talking earlier about Emma Morano and the fact that the doctor, uh, Carlo Bava, um, it's a woman who lived to be 117 years old in Italy. <laughs> 117, that's right. So she was already uh, eating three eggs a day from earlier in her life. And then when she turned 95 to 100, Carlo put her on, a, on 100 to 150 grams of raw meat per day. But lots of times people, journalists talk about that and they forget to mention that she started when she was around 100 yeah. doing this, right? So, so at 100, that, which is very bad if you were 45, uh, it becomes, I think, a, not a bad idea at all. And I, I never thought when, when Carlo told me that, the doctor, her doctor told me that, I never thought, are you crazy? And it's a funny story, actually. Huh. She went to him one day. And you knew her, you hung out with her. I, I, used, to, I, I used to go two or three times a year. And uh, it's a funny story. She went to Carlo one day and she said, uh, you know, Carlo, I think I need to stop eating meat. And, and he's like, why? why? And she said, my well, journalist came to me and he said, oh, you eat meat every day? This is going to give you cancer. <laughs> <laughs> and she was, I think, 107. <laughs> and, uh, so, but, but I thought it was very entertaining, right? To become, and also very telling of the very naive approach in yeah. nutrition, right? So this guy is telling a 107-year-old to worry about eating less meat. And as a journalist, because she's gonna get cancer. He's not thinking, no, she's not gonna die of cancer. She's gonna die of pneumonia. She's gonna die because she breaks uh, her hip, her hip yeah. and, and she falls down the stairs. Yeah. And, or passed. maybe the flu, she might yeah. die of the flu. Yeah, right? She's past the age of getting cancer and heart disease. Well, she might get cancer, but I mean, th that's okay. Uh, you, you really need to worry about lots of things in addition to cancer. Because the frailty is an issue. The frailty is an issue, and the frailty of the immune system is an issue, right? So immunosuppression. If the immune system is weak, then you're going to have all kinds of problems, right? So, so this is why I think, you know, complicated. you and I are, are now, and a few others are now moving into, the, you know, sort of generating this field of complexity. Uh, and I think historically it was ignored because people said it's food. Yeah. Right. What the hell could it possibly do, do to you? Right. Yeah. And now, now it's the most powerful drug on the planet. It's the most powerful drug, but it's very complicated, and the response is very complicated. Mm -hmm. So now it's probably the, one of the most complicated fields in medicine, Absolutely. right? Because the food is a thousands and thousands of components, and the body's got thousands and thousands of genes, and now ta all, all these join, you know, get together. And this is where nutri technology world comes from. It's like, what the hell happens when all this yeah. happens? Yeah. When you think about it, you've got 20,000 genes, but about 5 million variations in those genes, all affected by food. You've got, you know, the microbiome, which is 100 times as many uh, genes as our own genes, which is another 2 million genes that get affected. 
And you've got the chemical reactions in the body that happen every second. And most people don't know that there's 37 billion billion, that's 21 zeros, chemical reactions in the body every second, all of which interact with food. So that that's just mind boggling. How do you even do the math on those numbers yeah. of what's actually happening instead of a single pathway, a single drug? And that's the beauty of food and why it's so effective. And I, I want to dig into this complexity a little bit with you because the, the protein issue and the protein story is fascinating. In in your models, there's an, uh, a gene that gets activated or a pathway that gets activated called mTOR. And this pathway seems to be activated through protein and it seems to accelerate aging. When you're older, you need more protein. But like Emma Morano, she had 150 grams of raw meat. Why didn't that make her age faster if the protein activates mTOR? Yeah, so it's actually uh, what we call axis. And the axis is multiple pathways joined together. So it starts with growth hormone, releasing hormone, growth hormone, IGF-1, AKT, TOR, or possibly TOR without AKT. So there is a whole series of, of genes that are involved. And, and what happens is during aging, they go down naturally. So uh, if you're 25 years old, IGF-1 is going to be very high. If you're 90 years old, IGF-1 is going to be naturally very low. So what we showed in the paper a few years ago is that if you put a, a young, uh, an adult l younger than 50 on a high-protein, mid-protein, low-protein diet, IGF-1 and as a consequence TOR are going to be um, uh, associated with the level of proteins. Okay, So high-protein, high IGF-1, high TOR. Low-protein, low, low IGF-1, low TOR. If you look at a 65 and older person, you no longer saw any significant difference. Really? So, Either high or low protein, there was no change in the mTOR or the trend, IGF-1? trend, but no significant difference. I mean, in the overall, you cannot say that there is a change no matter how much protein you eat, right? So, so stay away from a lot of meat when you're younger, but once you hit 65, you can have the grass-fed steak, is that it? <laughs> that's what a journalist will say. <laughs> and that's what journalists, exactly what journalists say, at least some of them. Uh, no, you know, so, so the, the idea would be that as you get older and older, you can measure your IGF-1. And it's, let's say that you're 72 and your IGF-1 is 280, you should lower your protein. And that's a measure of growth hormone. Yeah, in in insulin-like growth factor one, yeah. right? So the one that they're circulating is pretty stable, right? So it stays stable in the blood. So it's better than measuring growth hormone because growth hormone is pulsatile right. and it's very hard, hard to follow. But IGF-1 now, most clinics can, can uh, cheaply measure it. And so if somebody is 72 and has got 280 IGF-1, they're eating too much protein. Yeah. And, and so you can still knock it down. And these, these people are at risk for multiple cancer, prostate, so where uh, should you be? You should be, we see the ideal level, 140. Hmm. 140 seems to be ideal. Whether you're, you're young or old, uh, now it could be very old that you know, it might not be that easy to keep 140. Uh, but uh, in but general, in the adult population, it, right? 140 seems to be ideal. But exercise increases that, right? I, I, no, I, uh, <laughs> exercise uh, does not have a big effect on IGF-1. Either way, either up or down. Hmm, fascinating. So, in in the um, in the research, you you're really talking about some really interesting things like Alzheimer's. So, how would this approach benefit Alzheimer's? Yeah. So, a few years ago, we published on uh, the first paper on um, our just the essential amino acids. So, if we took mice, they had uh, they were they had mutation, human mutation, to develop Alzheimer's. So, all these mice develop Alzheimer-like symptoms. They become cognitively impaired. They 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 don't learn anymore, and they do very poorly. So they're mice that can't find the cheese. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> and uh, so, if we uh, alternate uh, this, uh, if we affect the IGF one, this growth factor, and we make it go up and down by controlling just the essential amino acids. So uh, these are the the ones that you need to have to to have a normal function, right? The ones that People Those eat are the proteins building for. blocks yeah. of protein, yeah. amino acids. So right. if, let's say, we just simplify by saying, let's say we have the high protein, low, low, no protein diet, alternated. High protein, no protein, high protein. And we saw that this was sufficient to m reduce their cognitive impairment and to keep them protected uh, for longer uh, as they were getting old. So now we're doing both uh, uh, multiple mouse studies and a human clinical trial 
in Europe, uh, AUSC, multiple mouse studies with uh, two ma different Alzheimer's model. One is called uh, triple uh, transgenic model. It has three different mutations that uh, promote uh, Alzheimer, early Alzheimer in, um, in humans. And then we're doing another mouse model, so EPOE uh, mouse model for Alzheimer. And um, yeah, so we'll see. But uh, uh, our hope is that because the fasting mimicking diet revolution, and, and by the way, the Alzheimer one is a very special one where we uh, do it only once every two months because we're worried about frailty and we're worried about muscle loss. So we do it every two months and we give them uh, for 55 days, actually for all the days of the month, we give them a, a ketogenic supplement. Um, so we're, we're pushing the ketogenic state and uh, we want to ensure that they don't lose weight um, but we also want to give them the benefits of the extra ketogenic uh, chronic push. Yeah. So which yeah. is important because, you know, when brains are damaged with Alzheimer's, that basically it's like type three diabetes in the brain and it can't utilize glucose or sugar as well, but it can utilize fat or ketones, which yes. is why you see patients and the studies show, and I've had my own personal patients significantly improve when they have cognitive decline when you put them on a ketogenic diet. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the problem that we saw in our early approaches was the, the frailty. So if you take an 85-year-old and you put them on a ketogenic diet, you, you might end up seeing them pass out the day after, right? Yeah. So, well, you need so, to get enough fluid and salt. Yeah, and, yeah. So, yeah, so it's tricky. So we're thinking about uh, as you get it out there as a, as a treatment for everybody. I mean, not everybody has Mark Hyman. Uh, following them, right? So, so uh, yeah, in, in that case, I think you can experiment much more on things that are more extreme. And I'm not saying, I mean, I think eventually, I mean, there's already studies that have been published on ketogenic diet and Alzheimer. And I think uh, eventually there's going to be ways that are to do it that are safe. The question is, how long can you keep a patient on that diet? And how frail are they going to be after you know two or three months on that diet so those well, are i mean are, those diets increase muscle mass to increase body fat all right they, they activate yeah a lot yeah of the question is pathways. you know if you took uh, let's say 285 year olds and this is going to be really what, what you're looking at or 80 year olds and then you put them on the on this ketogenic diet how many problems are you going to see and is it possible that if you just do a much lower uh ketogenic and maybe alternate it with the FMD every two months, you get the same effects. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe you need to put them on a ninety percent uh, fat diet, and so so. I mean, those are the things that that uh, that need to be uh, determined. I was always very afraid, and I know the neurologists in Europe and in the USC were very afraid to take people with uh, close monitoring and put him on putting them on a, say 90% fat diet, revolutionize their diet. Because they're all we're saying, not with my patients. So, yeah. you know, there's the same war well, that we had I with mean, oncologists. I mean, listen, by the time someone's got Alzheimer's and they're going downhill, it's a desperate time. And doing desperate interventions sometimes yeah. can have amazing results. I've yeah, we're in the same choir, right? Yeah, so yeah. We're in the same choir. But I mean, when we first did this with a uh, cancer patient, it was a war. I mean, I'm talking screaming wars with yeah. oncologists. Because they tell them, oh, he pasta and eat tons of ice cream and have cake we and, just published oh in God, nature reviews me. we just published in nature reviews cancer and immediately after the publication the complaint from the nutritionist in cancer centers oh yeah and the complaint was official and said well but uh, in uh, uh, the standards in the european association of nutritionists and dietitians says this at least 1.2 grams of protein per day should be between 1.2 and 2 on and on and on and there, we responded and we said look if you look at the days where chemotherapy was first approved chemotherapy did tremendous damage forget the the restriction of protein and restriction of fat it did incredible damage and even killed a lot of people you know doxorubicin for example sure. and severe cardiotoxicity sure. and we approved it why because you know everybody agreed that it was worth to have there some is. side effects yeah. even they could be deadly potentially deadly which yeah. is not the case for the diet <laughs> and and everybody agreed and nobody you don't hear any oncologist complaining about chemotherapy and say right. why are you now saying that we're not allowed to even test and we we the the words we had used was uh, potentially promising 
they attacked the potentially promising, officially with a letter to Nature Reviews. Unbelievable. Potentially promising intervention. What we were trying to do is stimulate clinical trials and they managed to go after it. And so this is the, the well, world the old, we live in. Yeah, know? it's called, you know, there's a, there's a great book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions uh, by Thomas Kuhn where he talks about the idea of normal science. The normal conceptions and views and theories are very hard to overturn because people are stuck on their old way of thinking. And when someone comes out with a radical idea like you are, I'm sure you get a lot of attacks. Yeah, and so I'm saying for the neurologist, exactly the same, right? But we already knew, we had learned from the oncologist. So we came in very careful, say we don't want to get in words. Let's try to get in there with real data, mouse data, human data. Let's collect preliminary and then say, look, they're fine. So now with the ketogenic, let's push this 400 yeah. calories a day, yeah. I think it is, yeah. and see what happens. If they're fine, then we maybe we push it to 800 calories a day and, and, and combine it with the FMD. So, yeah. but, and then we'll see the results of other trials that, that are being done yeah. on, on Alzheimer's. And lots of groups are doing that. And then we decide. I think it's a, it's a good way well, to do it. This is a radical change in our thinking about medicine, which is that we can treat the underlying mechanisms of diseases that are all linked together through a simple common pathway, which is food, <laughs> and certain types of eating that actually activate all these healing pathways. The one thing I want to come back to, though, is the idea that carbohydrates are good or bad. And I think this is a debate out there now that's really on fire, whether it's ketogenic or you know, the high carb vegan community, and there's just complete polar opposite views. Um, you know, I, I follow the work of a guy named David Ludwig, who's a professor at Harvard, who's done a lot of work on insulin and the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis, and of course has been attacked for it. But he did a fascinating study looking at, it was a $12 million study, it was a feeding study where they gave everybody the food for a period of time. And they looked at what happened to their metabolism. And they found that they gave them a 60% fat diet it wasn't a high protein diet, it was 60% fat. Six zero. Six zero, or 60% carbs. And then the protein was like 20%, and the rest was, you know, they're switching over carbs and fat. And they found that the, the ones who had the high fat diet had much faster metabolisms. In other words, they burned an extra 250 calories a day. And if they were insulin resistant, they burned an extra 400 calories or 450 calories a day. And that would lead me to believe that the carbohydrates that we're eating are stimulating insulin, which is st really, I think, one of the main drivers of aging is activating insulin and activating all the inflammatory pathways that go with it and the insulin resistance in the brain and cancer and insulin resistance and heart disease and insulin resistance. How do you kind of explain that? Because it, it, it yeah. just, the data just the, seems all over the place. And no, no, it's not. It's not. <clears throat> the data seems all over the place until you look at all the pillars, right? And the pillars, again epidemiology, clinical studies, basic research, studies of centenarians. And so, for example, if you look at the work by Simpson in Australia, take mice, and you give it exactly what you said, a high fat or a high carb diet. And if you give it a high fat diet, they start losing weight, they look great for yeah. a little bit, yeah. and then they die earlier than the other mice, right? So, so you look good, but you die young. You look good, <laughs> you look good, and then oh, you no, die I'm earlier. Worried. I have like 6% uh, body fat. Now what am I going to do? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. This has nothing to do with uh, body We're fat. we go have some pasta because tonight. <laughs> the body fat, you're going to have lower with high fat diet. Uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, well, I guess yeah. that's your point. Yeah, yeah my muscle but, mass has increased. My body fat's down. That seems like a good thing when it comes to aging. Well, you know, it is and is not, right? So, oh, no. So <laughs> I, I think that... Um, they're probably, for example, fat stores a lot of the stem cells, right? And, and to the point that, that a lot of the stem cells for treatment are taken from fat. Mm. Um, so what don't we know about these organs? Fat also protects organs from uh, uh, stress and from movement. And so there is all kinds of things that could happen, not in, in somebody your age, but let's say, you know, 70, 75, 80, right? So what about that fat? What is it? Is it hurting them or is it helping them? Even in the mice, you know, the mice that respond the worst to calorie restriction. Earlier, you mentioned calorie restriction and the extension lifespan. Actually, it turns out that a third of the mice live longer than calorie restriction, a third of the mice have neutral effects, and a third of the mice live shorter. Really? And guess which one lived the shortest? The one that have the lowest fat storage capability. So, so it's, it's tricky, right? 
on one side you can have central adiposity, the fat, the visceral fat driving, and the liver fat driving lots of diseases. And on the other side, potentially subcutaneous fat uh, and, and other forms of fat, uh, this could be uh, helping an individual uh, and a mouse uh, live longer. That's true, but the, the carbohydrate load, particularly starch and sugar, not vegetable carbohydrates, which all agree are good, those drive visceral fat or belly fat. Yeah, so there is no doubt, there is no doubt that when the carbohydrate, the starches and the sugars, right, let's say, or the carbohydrate in general, but, you know, because also the fruits, right? Fruit, people uh, talk about fruit, this is like some great uh, food, but the fruit is, is packed with sugar, and some of them packed with fructose. And um, so th there is no doubt that that eventually are going to cause a problem, right? So there's no doubt. So the question is, when is that eventually? Uh, so for the centenarians of Okinawa, they used to eat 70% of the calories from sweet potatoes, purple potatoes. They never reached that eventually because um, they were fairly active. They didn't overeat. You know, these Okinawans are pretty behaved uh, as far as... The yeah, exactly. Fall, right? Get up when you're... And the Italians, you know, lots of these, uh, these, these little villages that have super longevity, including Molocchio, you, in the old days, lots of the centenarians, they're not obese. You know, they may be a little bit overweight. Now, their sons and grandsons and granddaughters, you're starting to see much bigger obesity, obesity problem. Yeah. So now they went from a great use of the carbohydrate to a poor use of the carbohydrate. And absolutely, once you make that switch and you have lots of pasta, bread, pizza, et cetera, et cetera, rice, then I think you're now generating a much bigger problem. That's when I think the ketogenic diet, the low carb, now becomes beneficial. The question is, how long should you keep it? Uh, keep that? And maybe that you until keep you it reset. until you, you reset, and then you learn how to behave, and you don't do yo-yo either, right? Because that seems to be bad too, back and forth. So you just maybe have Swings one or two break. shots, right? Use the ketogenic diet to, go to, to get to the longevity diet, right? Use the ketogenic diet, get there, because it's probably, and I'm becoming convinced that for people that have real problems, maybe that's the only way. But then move to a more long-term uh, longevity diet, which is fairly high carb of the good kind, only of the good, as much as possible the good kind. So, so you know, tons of vegetables and legumes, and, and much little, say, in the, the ideal dish is to me 50 grams of pasta and 500 grams of legumes and vegetables. I mean, nobody eats like this anymore, but everybody used to eat like that yeah. 60, 70 years ago, right? So I'm just saying, if everybody could do it, we can go back to it. Well, and so they did not have insulin resistance. No. They did not have, uh, they had these people in Okinawa and, and, and so Italian towns, zero and cardiovascular they disease. food and they weren't exposed they to were not, the toxins yeah, they were exposed to. They weren't had the chronic stress we have. They, yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but I, I don't think that, I think going back to their diet is not gonna, so I don't think that, that by being low carb, you're gonna counterbalance more the other problems uh, that we have now, right? So I think that, that um, you know, whether it's low carb or high carb, um, you know, we, we have to see. But certainly, if it's a vegan pescatarian diet and it's high carb of the legume and vegetable kind, yeah. uh, seems to be very, very good. Now, the question is, what if it was low carb vegan pescatarian? Some data suggests it could even be better, right? But some data suggests it could be worse. So it's, it's, it's really tricky. Yeah. Still, yeah. So uh, in, in your work, you also are showing that stem cells get activated through this process, which is what everybody is excited about, wants to go get. It costs tens of thousands of dollars. It's painful to suck out your bone marrow and fat. And you're saying just by changing your diet, you can activate your stem cells. Yes, so in mice it's very, very clear to the point that not only you activate the stem cells, but the more, much more important part is this very coordinated regeneration, rejuvenation program, both when, inside of the cell and at the organ level. So the point okay, where- stop, you just said there's a rejuvenation program embedded in our biology that we can turn on, and that's what your program does. Not my prog. I mean, yeah, this is what we 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 we'll discovered about. scientifically. But I don't want to make it my program. You know, but 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 yes. So this the fasting mimicking diet is designed uh, to push the body to start breaking components down, 
turn on the stem cells, and the stem cells, you see them, they're standing by. For example, when we uh, damage the, the, the pancreas of, of mice, you damage the pancreas of mice, they stop making insulin, and, and then you start, only then, you start the fasting-making diet, and you see that the, the pancreas is now turning this embryonic developmental uh, uh, program on, and, uh, uh, and all these genes that are only turned down when the pancreas is first generated, when the mouse is born, mm-hmm. start getting turned on. Many genes, right? So it's very clear it's a program. It's not just simply few genes around. All of them are on. And of course, you want to do that. When you repair your skin after you cut yourself, that's a program, right? You don't, things are not just re- getting repaired by, by chance. Right, right, right. Everything, every cytokine, every stem cell, it goes in, knows exactly where to go, it gets recruited, it binds to something else, and, and slowly it just rebuilds everything, right? Remarkable. And I always say, do you really think that we have a program so sophisticated for the outside of the body and we got nothing for the inside? There's no way. So the, the inside understands that, and I think fasting, but more safely, fasting mimicking diets uh, can trigger that program in the liver in the uh, pancreas, in the um, uh, hematopoietic system, in the brain, et cetera, et cetera. Now, so stressing wh- the body a little bit with the fasting mimicking diet actually activates all this program that... It, I don't think it's stressing. I don't like, I don't like this hormesis uh, uh, idea. You don't? I no, like- <laughs> I, I, I don't. I, I think it's much more uh, in, in, in a very strongly evolved program. If you don't have any food, you gotta break down components because you're not gonna make it, right? So mo- in, in the old days, whether you were a monkey or a mouse or a human, um, it could go, lots of people must have starved to death, right? So the, the program had to be very sophisticated to get you potentially. There's some people that have fasted for a year, six months to a year. So With no food? No food, yeah. Nothing. So, you know, bees, of course. Oh, but, okay. but, 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 uh, so the program you had to have a lot of storage (laughs) yeah and and we used to do that in the summer we used to eat a lot of fruit and gain a lot of fat right so that that was the the our our program so gain fat like the penguins right the emperor penguins in the south pole gain fat uh, and then make it try to make it through the winter by you know eating as little while eating as little as possible so well, that's what the bears do. They gave 500 pounds in the summer and then they hibernate all winter, lose it all, right? And that's what we used to do. Yeah. And not everybody used to do that, but certainly in, in, in very long periods of our history, that's what we used to do. So, yeah, so I think that uh, in that period, you're really breaking down almost everything to the point, let's say that before that, you might be BMI 13, 14. So BMI 13, 14, you're about that's to die. very low. Very yeah, it's very low. Very this is uh, Harshwitz, the, the, the prisoners, when they came Auschwitz, out, I think they yeah. had about 14 uh, uh, BMI. So a BMI, you are at the limit uh, between life and death. That's body mass index. Yeah, so yeah. imagine now this person that is, that is emaciated, re-expanding, as it happened after Auschwitz, to, uh, you know, some people died because they started eating too quickly, but other than that, you imagine this person that is starting to re-expanding all the organs and systems back to normal, say some of the organs may have tripled in size, right? So that imagine the program that is responsible for that rebuilding, right? Extremely sophisticated and it has to be the only explanation. It has to be the same program that it was used when we were first born. Yeah, and so the stem cells get regenerated, it helps. The stem cells realize that the liver is now very small and, and that you have a, a liver size that is now compatible with the, all the food is coming in. And so you slowly start expanding, expanding, expanding. And, uh, and same thing for the muscle. I mean, the, the BMI 14, you have yeah. almost no muscle the left. Muscle, yeah. So now you might, I don't think it is, is two or three fold. I mean, I'm just speculating widely here, but it may be tenfold, yeah. right? It may be that, that, that you're now 90% of your muscle within six months post this anorexic state is now new muscle. Yeah. Right? So how do you go from there, from point A to point B? Mm. And the only way is to have satellite cells coordinated in, my, in a coordinated way, beginning to uh, rebuild. And this is the stem cells that are part of this process, right? Yeah, stem cells are central in this process. Some of it is gonna be cellular. Mm. So the cell gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So it could be the very small uh, muscle cells. And then 
they, they re-expand, re right? Or very small liver cells, and they re-expand. This is one uh, uh, discussion we had recently at a conference that I uh, uh, organized, is, is that a, how much of the cell that and how much is size? I think both are, are involved. Yeah, so this is just fascinating. The, the other thing that comes to mind is, as a scientist looking at all this change in the biology that happens when you do fasting mimicking diet, it's a lot of it's laboratory research, some of it's clinical research. What biomarkers are available to us today? What tests can we do, the average person, say you, man, money wasn't an issue. What could you do to find out the things that you want to track as you get older that change when you do this? Because you must be following these things. And I'm curious, like, I want to go get the 10 things I want to know about myself that are going to show me whether my approach is working or not. Because does that exist? Is yes. This no, no, we're, we're about to do an app. And I think the company, El Nutra, that I, that I founded uh, is going to have an app uh, uh, soon in, in uh, something that Morgan Levine at Yale came up with. And there's 10 different markers. And there, I think this is, I really like that, um, maybe even more than the sort of epigenetic clocks, the, the stuff that over at UCLA and others came up with. Uh, I like that because um, it's also, it's sort of mixing health and longevity. But yeah. she's shown that it's a very, very good predictor of mortality. And uh, what are they looking at? Well, things like, I think, cholesterol, C-reactive protein. Uh, I don't know if IGF-1 is part of it. But there is many markers uh, that, are, uh, that are included. There's, I think, nine or ten markers. And, um, and now they're going to generate an app that way you could just uh, go to the app and put in the markers that you can get done in any clinic. Mm. And, and they will tell you your biological age. But aren't there things that are newer that people can check, like telomeres, for example? Or can you measure mTOR activity? Or can you measure activity of FOXO or genes or sirtuin genes? Or whatever the things are that you're looking at that are a little more esoteric, are those things that we're going to be clinically looking at in the future? Yes. I mean, in the future, yes. But right now, you know, whether it's telomere length or is senescent cells or i mean it there is not really a system yet to say let's say that you take something that in three weeks makes you three years younger uh, i think the best is still the blood uh, so the blood for example part of the inflammation right the consequence we say dysfunction inflammation well it should go back to normal if if, if the, whatever intervention you use is working whether you're insulin resistant, dysfunctional marker, or you have CRP that is high, or you have interleukin-6 that is high, et cetera, et cetera, they should be moving back to normal. So I think that that's a much, much more powerful way right now and for the next few years. I know it doesn't sound as cool as saying I'm going to measure the telomere length, but you can talk to any telomere expert, and even senescent expert, and they say, unless you use senolytics, the chance that all of a sudden in one week or two weeks or three weeks, you're going to um, have the telomeres getting uh, longer. No, but maybe uh, six months. I mean, I checked my telomeres recently and I'm 39, I'm 59 years old, but I'm biologically 39 according to that. Is that a valid metric? I, I think it's a, it's, a good, it's a good thing to show. Right? Would you see telomere uh, But for example, I would rather FMB? see I would see, rather see my white blood cell count and then my my lymph, lymphoid myeloid ratio. Right. I think that would be more telling. Do you, how is the ratio of myeloid cells and lymphocytes uh, in your body, and how strong is the immune system? Right? How responsive are you to a vaccine, for example? And so lots of these things can be measured now. That to me is a very functional measure yeah. of aging and age-related dysfunction. IGF-1 levels, uh, but, you know, insulin resistance. Um, is, yes, so the uh, cognitive performance, right? A yeah. fMRI, get an fMRI. I mean, if you can perform well on an fMRI, younger, it's a functional assessment. It means that your brain is working, working better. better. And, uh, you know, so well, you're, now you covered your, your muscle cells, your adipocytes, your brain cells, you know, maybe your liver. How quickly can your liver uh, get rid of so certain molecules? Uh, they are not toxic. So yeah, functional functional performance to me, um, like like uh, response to an antigen, and you can look at the titer of the antibody, right? So, so yeah. all these things that I think soon enough are going to be much more useful than how long is the telomere, yeah. uh, because well, yes, you're looking at it's di important. Di dynamic but, processes in the body and how they're working or not. Yeah, 
and then look at the functioning of these systems and it'll tell you a lot about what's going on whether you're aging or whether you're actually reversing aging i i can't wait i mean it's it's an exciting time to be alive because you're seeing all these advances happening in an accelerated way and your work has been really such a, a breakthrough in terms of our thinking about aging um and you've created not just this great body of research but you've also said look this stuff works i want people to be able to access this i don't want it just to be an academic ivory tower and you created this company called el nutra which created this product called prolon which is a five-day fasting mimicking dying kit that you can basically go online and get uh, and do this intermittently and see how you feel and what happens to you. It's, it's accessible now. And what's amazing is you've taken all the profits from this and from your book, The Longevity yeah, Diet. Big mistake. Ah! <laughs> well, hopefully <laughs> no, pay no. for your travel. No, 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 no. <laughs> but it's, you know, you're doing something good for the world and then you're taking the money from that and plowing that back into yeah, further uh, research. Yeah. Uh, what we're doing is I started this foundation called Create Cures and we're hoping... Um, you know, as I talk to, to lots of doctors out there that are like in the trenches, they say, well, it's very difficult to get money to do research. And so I hope at some point very soon, uh, and it's already happening, we now have enough funds that we can go back and, and look at the Alzheimer, look at the Parkinson, look at all the, these different things, and really in, in a foundation way say, you know, I always say, uh, uh, or you started the company, you, you must be telling people to do this all the time. I say, no, you only need the, to do this three times a year. And, you know, in the old days, the CEO got upset. And now he, I think he, he, he like, realizes it's, it's, a, it's about, you know, uh, getting people to 110 healthy. It's not about making money for the company. And I think if we do the right thing, the company is going to grow and the company, 60% is owned now, is going to be owned by the foundation now. I will donate 100% of my shares to it. So that means that uh, the foundation is going to get lots of funds. The more this company grows, the more the foundation grows, and the more we're going to do all these things. Uh, you know, you, you, everywhere in the world, people are saying, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, we're, we, they have lots of money. Everybody's working on drugs and there's no money for, for, food. for, for food research. Well, you know, now there is, right? And, and, and it's soon enough. You know, I'm talking one or two years. I'm not talking about 20 years. We might have billions of dollars. Really? Billions of dollars to devote to research. Can I borrow some for research? research? <laughs> you, you, yeah, of course. I'm going to apply oh, for a grant because we're trying to do food as medicine research of at course, Clinic. Yeah. So the people, we already tough. have a grant program and, and you, you're welcome to apply already now. And so, but I think, you know, in a couple of years, we're going to have another level of grant programs for scholarships, fellowships, uh, Because training, of the growth you know, of Prolon. Because of the growth of Prolon and the growth of the company. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That's so exciting. And that is brilliant because it's one of the big challenges in this field is that no one wants to study food and health and aging, even though, like we said, it's the most powerful drug out there. Yes, yes. And, and I mean, if you just look at what you said earlier, the effect of color restriction in completely eliminating diabetes in monkeys, monkeys, not mice, reducing cancer by 50% and reducing cardiovascular disease by 50%. I always say, how is it possible that we don't have incredible investment into this? Right? Can you imagine like decreasing wiping out diabetes because it's probably not number one right it's not patentable i don't know what it's it is food. but but it's crazy that the nih invests such a minuscule amount of money compared to the money that goes into everything else yeah to say find me a way that you can achieve what's already achieved by color restriction without the side effects of color restriction right you figure there should be half of the budget of the, the nih, NIH yes, sure. and and all the government agencies that are looking at health and say fine we'll keep funding everybody else but if we can reach this incredible goal of wiping out diabetes and reducing cancer and cardiovascular disease by 50 percent that's deserving of health of our funds. And I'm gonna, it didn't happen, it's not gonna happen. And the only way to do it, I think is we, the people that realize, hey, this is a good cause, it's a good product, are the people that basically can now fund what they want, right? The next generation of, of things, whether it's you, Mark, do it, or, or somebody yeah, else uh, in so a university exciting. does it. Yeah. I mean, you know, we spend 60 billion funds from the government on pharma research, 
we spend a billion on nutrition research. Yeah. And that has to change. That has to change. Yeah. So and we or that billion we're lucky if fifty million go into healthy longevity. Right. Nutrition and healthy longevity, right? right. So lots of the nutrition uh, uh, research is going to acute specific effects. Right. But it should really be how do we get to 110 healthy? Exactly. Everything else comes with it, right? So in a, in a sense, you're you're not studying disease, you're studying the science of health. What, how do the you long term health? How do you yeah. turn on healing mechanisms of the body and repair mechanisms? And that is a very big difference from trying to treat diseases and symptoms. Yeah. That and, is the future. And on top of it, the, the science of youth, right? So youth span first. Juventology. Yeah, you, juventology and youth span first. Then once you, of course, you get to 70 or 75, then health span, right? right. So then you do switch to, okay, I, now I kept you young until 70. Now I'm going to keep you healthy until 110. I mean, you know, we, we do what we can. It's not going to be any miracle there. But I think we can really at least achieve what was already achieved in monkeys. No way that we're not going to get there. And that's a pretty remarkable achievement. And people are not going to be old and sick. They're going to be old and healthy and contributing to our society. Right. And they're not going to be anorexic like in the calorie restriction study and miserable. You know. so, so that's what we have with the technology. We have to say clearly... If they got it with such a simple intervention, 30% less calories, but cause a lot of problems, how long is it going to take us to, and I think, you know, Prolon FMD is one of the ways, maybe ketogenic diet, maybe some forms of ketogenic diet. Let's get there. But I think let's not get there in 30 years. Let's begin to get there in the next two or three years and, and, and get, uh, um, you know, as many people as possible involved. Um, and then I think within the next 10, 15 years, uh, we can be there fully with anybody that wants to listen. I mean, not everybody's going to listen. Some people are just going to keep doing whatever it is. They're taking five drugs. I was, uh, you know, the other day I looked up how many people 18 to 34 take drugs. And I could not believe it. 53%. That's huge. I mean, I heard from one of the physicians at Cleveland Clinic, and I hadn't verified this, but he said that 40% uh, of the patients at Cleveland Clinic take 10 or more drugs. <laughs> This is like completely my, crazy. Yeah, you know? and you use food. It's the one drug, but it's so complex that it does all these amazing things. It's so great. So if, last question, if if you were going to, to, to blow up or sort of demystify one thing that people commonly think about nutrition, what would it be? Like what a myth one, is out a there? A one element culprit. High this, low that. Right. Much more complicated than that, you know. And I think that it's time now uh, to find the trusted sources and just say, yeah, I this guy or this woman, I trust them. They've been doing this for a long time. I make them accountable. And so you tell me what the complexity is and I follow it. Forget low protein, high protein, yeah, high carbs, yeah, low yeah. carbs, high fat, low fat. I agree. I mean, that's all meaningless. It's got to be age specific, person specific, but also personalized, but unpersonalized at the same time. Yeah. And already people There's are saying- Common you know, we, principles. We scare people because like, every time I talk, they start laughing. It's like, oh, what are you, it's too complicated. Well, exactly. It is too complicated, but we are making it very simple because now once you find the trusted source, the companies and the, and the experts, then in books, it's very easy to follow. You know, yeah, your book, my book, true. I think, you know, people can just say, hey, how long does it take? One week to figure it out. People don't even want to put one single week in, in changing their, their health for the rest of their life. Then I'm sorry, we're not for you. You know, <laughs> then, then we don't have a solution for you. You know, if you want to take 10 <laughs> drugs, uh, or if you want to be 19 years old and be on a drug, or you want to be 65 and be on 10 drugs, be our guest. It's but so uh, funny, but yeah. I think, yeah. The well, that's the beautiful yeah. thing about the longevity diet is that, and you said this before, which I'd never heard before, but it makes total sense. You wrote on all the things about eating principles that are known to be great and no one can argue with and that are basically beyond question, which is eat real food, eat good fish, eat lots and seeds, eat good fats, have lots of vegetables. It's basic yeah. principle. But the devil is in the detail. For example, low protein, not 20%, 10%. What's the source? Vegan plus fish. You know, right, so all of a right. sudden, if you look at Campbell, it, it, it says vegan. And I'm saying big mistake. Why? Because 
most people that are vegan, it could be great. I mean, some people can be vegan and be great. I'm not arguing with that, but it's extremely difficult. And then when you get old, you got a double problem now. Yeah. You know, so now you're vegan, you're going to, yeah, of course, you're going to lose muscle. You're going to, you're going to need more nourishment from simple sources like the cheeses, the the milk, et cetera, can help you when you're 93 years old. Right. So. The, this is this is I think is what's really important to begin to look at the detail. It's not just about yes the ingredients. Lots of us, but of course, lots of us agree. Lots of us disagree now. Now a lot of people say eat lots of meat and uh, eat lots of animal fat, and that's good for you. So yeah. you know, yeah, in one sense we're moving. A lot, lot of people agree w- with a lot of the things I picked, but lots of people now disagree. You know. So, well, the things that you say, I don't think anybody disagrees with because nobody says fish is bad. Nobody says olive oil is bad. Nobody says, they might say, oh, you could eat animal protein. Oh, maybe saturated fats aren't so bad. But right. the principles that you laid out, nobody's going to disagree with that as a healthy Oh, diet. you'd be surprised. Yeah, you'd be surprised. I mean, I, I actually, you know, kind of came up with a similar concept yeah. called the pegan diet, which was a joke because there were so many extremes of vegan and paleo. And I said, it's just, if you look at the principles of common sense combined with science and look at all the data it's not that hard right eat yeah. a lot of plants don't eat a ton of meat eat good yeah. fish. but for example for example I, I give you another simple example um the okinawa thing yeah you mentioned it earlier uh, uh, get up when you're 80 percent full it's a big mistake right i say eat more not eat less everybody every time i present really? every time i present you know so the devil is in the detail Wait, right? you say eat more but of course, eat more. Why? Because you have to think about your clientele. Your clientele is not an Okinawan that was born with my parents, my grandparents, everybody eating, getting up when they're 80% full. Your clientele, the Americans or the Europeans... We're getting up when they're 120% full. <laughs> well, there is signals in your stomach, both at the nourishment level and at the mechanical level, that are telling your brain, now I'm full. If you're getting up when you're 80% full, your your the the message to americans european is going to be i'm hungry all day and guess what's going to happen gonna within overeat. a year you're going to start overeating again if you get up when you're full because you're full of fibers vegetables nourishment the minerals are there uh, the the micromolecules uh, uh, are there the macromolecules uh, everything is there the signals to your brain is like okay i got everything i need the signal to your stomach is I got everything I need. The signal to your microbiota is I got but everything. Overeating I need. isn't good. No, no, I don't mean overeating. I mean eat until eat the right things until and, your stomach and you know, is it takes full. Twenty you know? minutes. You have to eat slow because it takes twenty minutes for your stomach to tell your brain that you're full. And most of us have experienced yeah, that. Yeah, but if, if it's fiber, if it's uh, what I describe, you know, three hundred grams of chickpeas and two hundred grams of vegetables and 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 50 grams of pasta in between gonna that's going to be there for hours and hours <laughs> yeah. and hours right so the message for a long time during the day is like the bariatric concept sure. right small stomach message the brain stop oh, eating right? right so it's it's the same thing and so i think you see that yeah. uh, the devil is in the detail little things and every time i present everybody says oh you're you're going to tell us to eat less it's like i never say to eat less i never worked on calories for five days <laughs> well yes for five days three or four times a year yeah, yeah. so that's the only i mean that's very it. little time compared to the rest of the year right well, so. i'm definitely going to try it and i thank you so much dr longo for being on the doctor's pharmacy you're a brilliant man contributing greatly to our understanding of aging and health uh, and food if you want to learn more about his work go to walterlongo.com that's walter with a v v a l t e r longo l o n g o.com if you want to learn about prolon the fasting and making diet and try it uh, you can go to prolonfmd.com that's fasting and making diet so prolon p r l o n f m d.com it's really amazing. I got a box at home. I can't wait to try it, and I'm excited for it. So I'll share the results with you when I do it, and uh, we'll see what happens. I might get to 30 from 39. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Longo, for joining us. And uh, if you've loved this podcast, please share it with your friends and family on social media. Sign up if you liked it, wherever you get your podcasts, and iTunes, Google Play, or wherever. Uh, and leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you and know what you think. And we'll see you next time on The Doctor's Pharmacy. Thanks, Mark.